The Theology of Christian Perfection, Part 10. In another place, uh, in the same work, Father Garrigou Lagrange completes his doctorate in the following manner. The grace of a happy death, or of final perseverance, cannot be merited condignly in the strict sense of the word, even, not even strictly congruous. It is, however, necessity for salvation, and we ought certainly to desire it, to dispose ourselves for it, and to ask for it incessantly, because the persevering prayer will obtain it for us. The same may be said for the grace of conversion or justification for a sinner. It cannot be merited, since it is the principle of merit. Yet any one in the state of mortal sin ought, with the actual grace offered him, to desire and ask for it. These are profound mysteries of the efficacy of grace and predestination. The grace of justification and that of final perseverance are necessary for salvation, but they cannot be merited condignly. The same is true of efficacious graces which keep us in the state of grace. The grace of infused contemplation is not gratuitous, since one can progressively merit condignly a very high degree of the gift of wisdom, considering it as a habitus, and since the Holy Ghost generally inspires souls according to the degree of their habitual docility. Moreover, we must add to merit the impetrative power of prayer. Since we ought to ask for the grace of a happy death, which we are unable to merit, a fervent soul may indeed, with as much confidence as humility, also ask for the grace of contemplation in order to live the mysteries of salvation more fully, to know its own wretchedness better, to humble itself on this account, and to be less indifferent to the glory of God and the salvation of souls. Reduced to common terms, this is what the soul requests when he recites the Veni Creator with sincerity. The grace of contemplation is thereby less gratuitous than graces gratis de te, such as the grace of a miracle or prophecy, which are in no way necessary to our personal sanctification. After all, the fact remains that the Holy Ghost breathes where he wills, and when he wills, for we do not exercise at will that acts. After all, the fact remains that the Holy Ghost breathes where he wills, and when he, when he wills, for we do not exercise at will the acts which proceed from the gifts of the Holy Ghost. We can summarize our doctrine on the question of the relationship between merit and the mystical life by stating the following conclusions. 1. The increase of grace and of the virtues and gifts of the Holy Spirit as habits can be merited in condigno. 2. By good works and fidelity to grace one can merit de congruo, and by humble and persevering prayer one can penetrate infallibly, by reason of the divine promise. Actual efficacious graces, which will put the habit of the gifts into operation, thus normally produce the mystical phenomenon. 3. Due to human weakness and misery, it often happens in practice that a man does not do all that he should in order to merit actual graces by congruous merit, nor is his prayer accompanied by the conditions necessary to impetrate these graces infallibly, so that he lacks them by reason of his negligence or his lack of generosity. 4. Where merit de condigno and merit de congruo are lacking, and also even the conditions necessary for the infallible impetration of actual graces, 
through prayer. It may sometimes happen that God supplies the defect of his creature by granting him, out of pure mercy and in spite of the lack of the proper dispositions, those actual efficacious graces which produce the mystical phenomenon through the actuation of the gifts of, of the Holy Ghost. But God has no obligation to do this, and frequently he denies these things to souls that are voluntarily imperfect. This explains why, de facto, there are so few mystics in spite of the fact that, de jure, all souls are called to the mystical state. And this is the sense in which one must interpret it, the texts of the mystics, when they say that God gives the grace of contemplation as he wills, and when he wills, and sometimes even to souls that are negligent. 5. Consequently, de jure, or by reason of the exigencies of grace, the mystical life is merited de condigno under one aspect, the development of the gifts as habits, and can be merited de congruo and obtained infallibly through prayer under another aspect, the actuation of the gifts which produces the mystical phenomenon under the impetus of an efficacious actual grace. In this sense, it can be said that the mystical life is infallibly available to all generous souls who place no obstacles to grace and properly dispose themselves for it. The fact that in common there are so few mystics does not in any way compromise the normal order of the exigencies of grace de jour. We believe that these conclusions can serve as a point of contact between the various mystical schools which appear to be antagonistic, such as the Thomists and the Carmelites, for the discrepancies are more apparent than real. The Thomistic school, accompany, accustomed to lofty theological speculation, forcefully states the exigencies of the juridical order and sees the mystical life contained virtually in the seed of grace. The Carmelite school, accustomed to follow the experimental mystics, emphasizes above all the remarkable scarcity of mystics and denies in the concrete order that which the Thomists affirm in the juridical order. We believe that both schools should come to an agreement if they would state the meaning of the question with greater precision. The fourth objection is given by Father Poulain in his work, The Graces of Interior Prayer. But if mystical contemplation is produced by the gifts of the Holy Ghost, the converse, namely, that every act produced by certain gifts is mystical and false. For that would be tantamount to saying that these gifts never operate in ordinary prayer. Now such a thesis has never been laid down. It is not in conformity with St. Thomas's teaching, which holds that the gifts are not reserved for difficult acts alone. And further, if this proposition were true, the mystics would swarm upon the globe, for at confirmation and even at baptism every Christian believes these gifts, and no one can hold that they continue in the state of pure habit without any actuation. It does not follow that all Christians begin to share imperfectly in mystical graces from the very beginning of the spiritual life. Mystics would swarm all over the world. It would not occur to anyone to call a person a pianist who is just learning how to play the piano, although he plays it very often, but only when he is able to play with facility and by habit. In like manner, it is not correct to call the imperfect Christian a mystic, although the Holy Spirit may occasionally produce in him imperfect mystical acts, since the disposition of the soul is as yet too imperfect for anything else.
The true mystic is not one who only occasionally performs a mystical act under the influence of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but one who is habitually docile to the movement of the Holy Ghost and lets himself be led to the full mystical state. This objection is absolutely without force because it contains an equivocation. It can be answered with a simple distinction that imperfect mystical acts are to be found all over the world. We concede that mystical souls are to be found all over the world. We deny. Mystical souls are few and are always rare because the mystical state requires heroic abnegation and a complete abandonment of self to the operation of the Holy Ghost without reservation. We should not forget that mystical souls are souls of heroic virtue. They are the souls of saints. The last objection states that for the beatification and canonization of the servants of God, the Church never takes into account whether or not the individuals had infused com contemplation or any other mystical phenomenon, but only whether they habitually practiced the infused virtues in a heroic degree. This is stated by Pope Benedict the Fourteenth in his work De Beatificatione Servorum De et De Piatorum Canonization. This object proves absolutely nothing. Even more, if one could use it as a defense for the argument in favor of our thesis, for if the Church canonizes only those who have habitually practiced the infused virtue in a heroic degree, to which the virtues cannot reach without the influence of the gifts of the Holy Ghost operating in a di divine manner, it follows that the Church canonizes only those who are mystics. It is not surprising that the process of canonization does not consider whether an individual had infused contemplation. Infused contemplation and the other mystical gifts which are related to the normal development of very sanctifying grace, and not, we note, the graces gratis date, which are not necessary for perfection are intimate graces which give the mystic an ineffable experience of the divine, and hence it follows that as such they can completely escape the extermination of those who are testing the sanctity of, of a servant of God. They can be known only indirectly through their marvelous effects, which are the virtues practiced in a heroic degree under the modality of the gifts and this it is which gives them that superhuman and heroic intensity. The cause of this phenomenon is purely internal, and therefore we must comply the principle of canon law, de internis non judicat ecclesia. The Church is concerned only with that which is externally evident and can be proved by testimony. The practice of the Christian virtues in a heroic degree. Once this has been proved, the Church merely waits for the manifestation of the divine will, which is the miracles effected through the intercession of the servant of God in order to proceed to the beatification and canonization. Consequently, this objection not only does not prove what it intends, it favors the thesis which it was meant to attack. From the fact that the Church canonizes only those who have practiced the virtues in a heroic or superhuman degree, which cannot be affected without the actuation of the gifts of the Holy Ghost, it follows that the Church canonizes only those who are mystics. Chapter 4. Models of Perfection Configuration with Christ is the goal of our Christian life, since we thereby attain our own sanctification, at the same time give the greatest possible glory to God. In the present plan of divine providence we cannot perfectly sanctify ourselves, nor give the greatest possible glory, 
to God except through Christ and in Christ. For that reason, it is of the greatest importance to have clear notions concerning the applications of Christology to the Christian life. Until recently, relatively little emphasis was placed on the role of Christ in our sanctification, except for some of the outstanding classical works of spiritual doctrine, such as the writings of St. Bernard, St. Catherine of Siena, and St. Teresa of Avila. This deficiency can be explained by recalling the exaggerated doctrines which were prevalent in France in the 17th century, with the result that the Church had to impose certain restrictions on the spiritual doctrines relative to the humanity of Christ. As a result, devotion to Christ was gradually regulated to a second place as one of the various means to sanctity. While, in fact, Christ is the cornerstone of our sanctification, we shall be saints only in the measure that we live the life of Christ, or rather, in the measure that Christ lives his life in us. The process of sanctification is a process of Christification. The Christian must be converted into another Christ, only when he can say in truth, I live, not now not I, but Christ liveth in me. He can be sure that he has reached the heights of perfection. The Mystery of Christ Christ's role in the life of his members is one of the predominant thoughts in the teachings of St. Paul. His entire apostolate consists in revealing to the world the mystery of Christ, Colossians 4.3. To enlighten all men as to what is the dispensation of the mystery which had been hidden from eternity in God, Ephesians 3.9, in whom dwells the future of the Godhead bodily, Colossians 2.9, so that they may be filled unto the, all the fullness of God. Ephesians 3.19 We can summarize the application of Christology to the Christian life by taking the words which Christ spoke of himself when he stated, I am the way and the truth and the life. John 14.6 Jesus Christ is the only way. No one can go to the Father except through him, and there has been given to him no other name under heaven which we can be saved. According to the divine plan of our predestination, the sanctity to which Christ calls us through grace and adoption consists in a participation in the divine life which was brought to the world by Christ. This is expressly stated in divine revelation as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blemish in his sight of love. He predestined us to be adopted through, the, through Jesus Christ as his sons, according to the purpose of his will, into the praise of his glory of his God, which he has favored us in his beloved Son. Ephesians 1, 4 through 6. Christ has re-established the divine plan of our salvation, which had been destroyed by the sins of Adam. In this has the love of God been shown in our case, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we may live through him. 1 John 4, 9. Hence Christ is the only way by which we can go to the Father, and without him we can do absolutely nothing. Therefore the preoccupation of every Christian must be to live the life of Christ, be incorporated in him, and to let the sap of the true vine circulate through his veins. Christ is the vine and we are the branches and the life of the branch depends on its union with the vine which imparts to it the vivifying sap. St. Paul was unable to find any words in human language which could adequately express the incorporation 
of the Christian in the vine. Everything about the Christian, his life, death, and resurrection, must be intimately connected with Christ, and in order to express these pro profound truths, St. Paul had to invent expressions which had never been used. For if we have died with him, con mortui, 2 Timothy 2.11, we were buried with him, con sepulti, Romans 6.4. But God raises us together, con res rescusitiati, Ephesians 2.6 and brought us to life together with Christ, so that we shall live with him, and sit together in the heaven in Jesus Christ. In view of the foregoing Pauline doctrine, we can heartily agree with the following observations of the saintly Dom Marmion. We must understand that we can only be saints according to the measure in which the life of Jesus is in us, that is the only holiness God asks of us. There is no other. We can only be holy in Christ Jesus, otherwise we cannot be so at all. There is not an atom of his holiness in creation. It proceeds from God by a supremely free act of his almighty will. St. Paul returns when more than once to the gratuitous of the divine gift, of adoption, and also the eternity of the ineffable love which determined him to make us partakers of it, and to the wonderful means of realizing it through the grace of Jesus Christ. Christ is, therefore, the only way of going to the Father. He is the only possible form of sanctity according to the divine plan. Only through him, with him, and in him can we attain the ideal intended by God in the creation, redemption, and sanctification of the human race? The praise of his glory, Ephesians 1, 5, and 6. The Church reminds us of this daily in one of the most solemn moments of the Mass. Per ipsum et cum ipso et in ipso estibi, Deo Patre om omnipotenti, in unitati spiritu sancti omnes ho honor et gloria only through his beloved son will the father accept our love and homage for that reason the great saints enlightened by god in a special manner to understand the mystery of christ wish to be dissolved and to be absorbed by christ so that he could live their life in them sister elizabeth of the trinity one of the souls who penetrated this mystery most profoundly asked Christ, I realize my weakness and beseech thee to clothe thee with thyself and to identify my soul with all the movements of thine own. Immerse me in thyself, possess me wholly, substitute thyself for me, that my life may be but a radiance of thine own. Enter my soul as adorer, as restorer, as saviour. O eternal word, utterance of my God, I long to pass my life in listening to thee, to become docile that I may learn all from thee. O consuming fire, spirit of love, descend within me and reproduce in me, as it were, an incarnation of the word, that I may be to him another humanity wherein he renews his mystery. And thou, O Father, bend down towards thy poor little creature and overshadow her, beholding in her none other than thy beloved Son in whom thou hast set all thy pleasure. How mistaken are they who consider devotion to Christ as merely another pious exercise! Our incorporation in Christ is the very basis of our sanctification and the very substance of our spiritual life. It is from this fundamental dogma that all other ascetical and mystical teachings spring. The soul that wish sincerely to sanctify themselves would do well, therefore, 
to ignore the disputes and arguments among the various schools of spirituality and dedicate themselves to living more and more profoundly the life of Christ. If they do this, they will surely reach the summit of sanctity, and there they will find all the saints without exception, and will be able to repeat with them, It is now no longer that I live, but Christ lives in me. Galatians 2.20 the most beautiful compositions by human genius fade into nothingness when compared with a single statement from the Sermon on the Mount. All of Christ's doctrines, from Sermon on the Mount to the poignant seven last words, is a sublime summary of instruction for attaining sanctity. The soul that wishes to find the true way for going to God need only open the gospel of Jesus Christ and there drink divine knowledge at its source. As St. Therese of Lisieux declared, I seldom find anything in books except in the gospel. That book suffices for me. In speaking of Christ as our life, we arrive at the most profound and the most beautiful aspect of the mystery of Christ. Christ is our life in three different manners. So far as he merited grace for us, which is the life of the soul, meritorious cause, so far that the supernatural life springs from him, efficient cause, and so far as he communicates that life to us, capital influence. The merit of Christ in relation to us is intimately connected with his redemptive sacrifice. Let us review briefly the fundamental points concerning his infinite satisfaction, which merited for us and restored to us the supernatural life which had been lost through the sin of Adam. It was impossible for the human race to make condign satisfaction for the sin of Adam. If he had so desired, God could have freely give, forgiven the debt but if he were to demand rigorous satisfaction, the impotence of the human race was absolute. Due to the infinite distance between God and man, only a god man could bridge that infinite chasm and offer divine justice a complete satisfaction. Presupposing all this, the incarnation of the Word was absolutely necessary for the redemption of the human race. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. John 1.14 Since Christ united in himself the two natures, divine and human, in one divine person, all his actions had, by, had an infinite divine rule. He could have redeemed millions of worlds by a mere smile or by his slightest action, but the redemption of the world actually was effected only through the sacrifice of the cross. This is what the Father willed. Theologians have attempted to penetrate this mystery of the crucifixion and death of Christ to redeem the world but it will always remain a secret of the inscrutable designs of divine providence. Christ merited not only for himself, but for us, with the merit of strict justice, di continuo ex toto rigore justite, justitate, as the theologians say. This justice has its foundation in the capital grace of Christ, in virtue of which he is constituted head of the entire human race, and in the sovereign liberty of all his actions and ineffable love with, with which he accepted his passion in order to save us. The efficacy of his merits and satisfactions is strictly infinite, and for that reason inexhaustible. That should arouse in us the boundless confidence in his love and mercy. 
In spite of our weakness, the merits of Christ have a superabundant efficacy to lead us to the heights of perfection. His merits are ours and they are at our disposal. In heaven he continues to intercede for us constantly. Hebrews 7.25 Our weakness and poverty constitute a title to the divine mercy and when we avail ourselves of this title we give great glory to the Father because we thereby proclaim that Jesus is the only mediator whom it has pleased Father to send to earth. For this reason no man should become discouraged when he considers his own weakness and misery. The inexhaustible riches of Christ are at our disposition. Ephesians 3.8 All the supernatural graces which man has received from the fall of Adam to the coming of Christ have been granted only in reference to Christ. Intuitu meritorum Christi. And all the riches which men will receive until the end of time will spring forth from the heart of Christ. We do not have the gratia Dei, as did our first parents and the angels, but we have the gratia Christi, that is, the grace of God through Christ. This grace is given to us in many ways, but the source from which it flows is Christ, the sacred humanity united to the person of the world. This is what is meant by the phrase, Christ, the efficient cause of grace. Jesus is the fountain of life. His sacred humanity is the instrument united to his divinity for the efficient production of the supernatural life. Even more, the very humanity of Christ can also be a source of bodily life, for the Gospel tells us that there went forth from Christ a power which cured the sick and raised the dead to life. Luke 6.19 But we are here interested primarily in Christ as the fountain and the source of supernatural life. In order to give us our natural life, God utilizes our parents as instruments to give us a supernatural life. He utilizes the sacred hu humanity of Christ. Christ has been constituted by the Heavenly Father as head pontiff, mediator, source and dispenser of all graces, and particularly as Redeemer, and in reference to his passion and death, St. Paul states that he emptied himself, taking the nature of a slave and being made like unto men, and appearing in the form of man, and in habit found as man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even to death on a cross. Therefore God also had exalted him and has bestowed upon him the name which is above every name, so that the babe name of Jesus every knee should bend of those in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. For every tongue should confess that the Lord Jesus Christ is in the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, 7 through 11. The Gospel illustrates the manner in which Christ used his sacred humanity to confer supernatural life on souls. Son, he said to the paralytic, thy sins have, are forgiven thee. Immediately there was a reaction of surprise and scandal among the bystanders. Who is this man who pretends to forgive sins? Only God can do this. But Jesus turns to them and gives them a convincing argument that he, as man, has the power to forgive sins. Which is easier, he asks them, to say thy sins are forgiven thee, or to say arise, take up thy bed and walk? 
but that you may know the Son of Man has the power to forgive sins. And then he addresses the paralytic, Rise, take thy bed, and go into thy house. Christ used the expression, Son of Man, deliberately. It is true that only God, or one who through the power of God is authorized to do so, can forgive sins. Therefore, he who would dare to forgive sins, not in the name of God, but in his own name, has in addition worked a stupendous miracle to testify to his power, must indeed have the personal power to forgive sins. Christ is the Son of God and the author of grace, and he alone has power to forgive sins by his own authority. But in doing so, he used his sacred humanity as an instrument in the production of supernatural life in souls. Hence he used the expression, Son of Man, in order to signify that if he, as man, worked miracles, conferred grace, and pardoned sins, it is because his sacred humanity is of itself vivifying. In other words, his humanity is an apt instrument for producing and causing grace by reason of its personal and hypostatic union with the divine word. There is no difficulty in explaining the instrumental causality of the sacred humanity of Christ while he was yet on earth. But what is to be said of the influence of his humanity after his ascension into heaven? Is the influence of his sacred humanity now only a moral causality, or is it still physical? Jesus is head of the mystical body which is his church, and all things he made subject under his feet, and he gave as head over all the church, which is indeed his body, the completion of him who fills all with all. Ephesians 1 22-23. St. Thomas asks whether Christ is a, as man is head of the church, and answers the question by establishing an analogy with the natural order. In the human head, he states, we can consider three things, order, perfection, and power. Order, because the head is the first part of man beginning from the highest part, perfection, because in the head dwell all the senses, both interior and exterior, while in the other members there is only the sense of touch, power, because the power of the movement of other members, as well as the direction of their acts, is from the head, by reason of the sensitive and motive power which rules there. Now all these characteristics are found in Christ spiritually, therefore Christ is head of the church. He has the primacy of order because he is the firstborn among many brethren, Romans 8.28, and has been constituted above every principality and power and virtue and dominion, in short above every name that is named not only in this world, but also that which is to come. Ephesians 1.21 So that in all things he may have the first place. Colossians 1.18 has, He has perfection above all others, because in him is found the plenitude of all graces, according to St. John, full of grace and of truth. 114. Lastly, he has the vital power over all the members of the church because of his plenitude we have all received. John 116. St. Paul summarizes three characteristics in one body. When he writes to the Colossians, he is the head of the body and the church. He who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, 
that in all things he may have the first place. For it has pleased God the Father that in him all his fullness should dwell, and that through him he should reconcile himself all things, whether on the earth or in the heavens, making peace through the blood of his cross. One eighteen twenty. And St. Thomas, in another place, proves that Christ is the head of the Church by reason of his dignity, his government, and his causality. The formal reason for Christ's headship is the plenitude of his habitual grace, connoting the grace of union. Hence, according to St. Thomas, the personal grace by which the soul of Christ is sanctified is essentially the same as by that he justifies others. As head of the church, there is only a rational distinction between them. How far does this capital grace of Christ extend? Who are affected by it, and in what degree? According to St. Thomas, it extends to all the angels and to all men, except the damned, but in various manners and degrees. That Christ is head of the angels is explicitly stated in the epistle of St. Paul to the Colossians. Christ is head of the entire multitude because of his sacred humanity, personally united to the word, consequently shares in the grace and gifts of the word much more than do the angels, and he also infuses in them many graces such as accidental glory, charisms, revelations of the mystery of God, etc. Therefore, Christ is head of the angels. Christ is also head of men, but in different degrees. He is head of the blessed in a most perfect manner because they are united with him definitely by confirmation in grace and glory. And same is true regarding the souls in purgatory as pertains to confirmation in grace. He is head of all men in the state of grace because they possess supernatural life and are united to Christ as living members through grace and charity. He is head of Christians in the state of mortal sin, although less perfectly, since they are actually united to Christ through unformed faith and hope. Formal heretics and pagans are not actual but potential manners, members of Christ. Those of this group are predestined one day to pass from potential to actual members of Christ. The devils and the damned, on the other hand, are in no sense members of Christ, nor are the souls in limbo, for they are definitively separated from Christ and can never be united with him through sanctifying grace. But how does Christ exercise his influence on the living members who are united to him in this life through grace and charity? He exercises it in many ways, but they can all be summarized under two headings, through the sacraments and through a contact by faith which is vivified by charity. Sacramental Influence It is de fide that Christ is the author of the sacraments. It must be so because the sacraments are defined as sensible signs which signify and produce sanctifying grace, and only Christ, who is the unique source of grace, could constitute them. And he instituted them precisely to, communication, to communicate his own divine life to us through them, these sensible signs have the power of communicating grace by their own intrinsic power, ex opere operato, but only as instruments of God, that is, in virtue of the 
the impulse which they receive from the humanity of Christ united to the word for that reason the unworthiness of the human minister who confers the sacrament whether he be sinner or heretic is no obstacle to its validity as long as he had the intention of doing what the church does in the administration of the sacrament Christ wished to place the communion of his divine grace through the sacraments completely outside human weakness with the result that we can have complete confidence in the efficacy of the sacraments as long as we ourselves do not place any obstacle to their sanctifying effects this last point needs special emphasis among modern Christians for it is possible for them to place an insuperable obstacle to the sanctifying effects of a sacrament no sacrament is valid if one does not interiorly consent to receive it the lack of repentance impedes the reception of grace in the sacrament of penance or in the baptism of an adult in the state of mortal sin conscious moral sin prevents the reception of grace in the five sacraments of the living and makes the actions sacrilegious but even if one possesses the necessary dispositions for the valid and fruitful reception of the sacraments the measure of grace received in each case will depend not only on the excellence of the sacrament itself but on the perfection and fervor of one's disposition if the individual approaches the sacrament with a hunger and thirst to be united to god through grace he will rec receive an abundance of grace as the classical example of the fountain and the vessel illustrates the amount of water received will depend not on the fountain but on the size of the vessel in which the water is received from this follows the great importance of proper preparation for the reception of the sacraments especially of the Eucharist which brings not only grace but the very fountain and source of grace it is through the sacraments especially that Christ exercises his vital influence on us and we should be approached them with the desire of increasing our supernatural life and our union with God they are the authentic channels of grace and there is nothing else that can replace them some souls not realizing these truths prefer other pious practices and devotions which are infinitely less efficacious than the sacraments it is an injury to Christ not to appreciate or to regulate the second place these channels of grace which he, he instituted as a means of increasing our supernatural life contact through faith as regards our contact with Christ through a vivifying faith st. Paul uses a mysterious expression in one of his epistles he says that Christ dwells in our hearts through faith Ephesians 3:17. what do these words mean is he referring to some kind of indwelling of Christ in their in our souls similar to the indwelling of the Trinity it would be a great error to think this the humanity of Christ is physically present in us through communion but this presence is so closely bound to the sacramental species that when they are substantially altered Christ's physical appearance ceased entirely and there remain in the soul only his divinity together with the Father and the Holy Ghost and the influence of his grace nevertheless it is a fact that Christ does in some way dwell in our hearts through faith 
St. Thomas does not hesitate to interpret the words of St. Paul literally. Christ dwells in us by faith. Ephesians 3.17 Consequently, by faith, Christ's power is united to us. In other words, it is the power of Christ which dwells in us through faith, and as often as we turn to him through the contact of a faith vivified by charity, a sanctifying power emanates from Christ to our souls. The Christ of today is the same Christ of the gospel, and all who approach him through faith and love will share in the power that emanates from him to cure the sickness of body and soul. Luke 6.19 How then, asks Dom Marmion, can we doubt that when we approach him, even outside the sacraments, with humility and confidence, divine power comes forth from him to enlighten, strengthen, and help us. No one has ever approached Jesus Christ with faith without being touched by the beneficent rays that ever escape from this furnace of light and heat. Virtus di illo exiban. Therefore the soul that would sanctify itself should increase the intensity more and more this contact with Christ through an ardent faith vivified by charity. This exercise can be performed at any moment, many times a day, while the sacramental contact through the Holy Communion can only once daily. Physical Influence we can now return to our previous question concerning the nature of the vital influence which the humanity of Christ has on us. Is it a physical or only a moral influence? The theologians are divided on the answer. Some hold for a merely moral influence, but the Thomists genetically defend the physical influence of the humanity of Christ. This is simply an extension of their teaching on the physical causality of the sacraments in the production of grace. If the sacraments, which are separated instruments of Christ, produce grace physically, why would not the humanity of Christ, which is a conjoined instrument, do likewise? The greatest difficulty which opposes this teaching is the fact that a physical action presupposes a physical contact between the agent and the patient. Such a contact was realized during the earthly life of Christ, as when he healed by a touch of his hand. But how could this physical contact be verified now that the humanity is triumphant in heaven? The answer to the objection calls for various distinctions. In the first place, the objection supposes the type of physical causality on the part of the humanity of Christ, which cannot be accepted, for it refers to a contact which is quantitative. But the humanity of Christ comprises both his body and his soul, and the soul of Christ can operate through his will, as an instrument of the word, even as regards supernatural effects which are physically distanced from him. The human will of Christ was elevated to the production or immediate causality of the supernatural works by his volitional power, and the rest of his humanity came under this command of the will. Moreover, if the humanity of Christ is not physically present in all places, the divine word, to whom it is hypostatically united, is so present. There is nothing inconvenient in the fact that the word should use the instrumental power of his sacred humanity in the production of souls, of grace in their souls. For this, a virtual contact of the humanity of Christ would suffice, as St. Thomas explains in regard to the efficient causality of the resurrection of Christ on our resurrection. Again, one must attribute to the triumphant humanity of Christ 
all the prerogatives which had there had here on earth as long as they are not incompatible with the state of glory. But physical instrumentality is perfectly compatible with the state of glory. Otherwise, the humanity of Christ in glory possesses his physical instrument causality. Otherwise, the sacred humanity would be less perfect in heaven than it was on earth. Lastly, the whole plan of the Incarnation is more beautiful when seen in the light of this teaching. The physical action of Christ is not restricted to the Eucharist, but Christ's present is felt in all places through all the centuries. Christ continues to pass through the world, doing good and healing all. Acts 10.38